penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Thank you. Good morning, sir. State your full name for the record, please. Good morning. Seth Andrew Kenny. Um, Mr. Kenny, <clears throat> where to begin? Um, in October of 2021, what kind of business did you run? I ran a, um, a prop and weapons supply uh, house to the film and entertainment industry. Could be anything from theater um, and also volunteer work associated with uh, active shooter training. Okay. W would you move that microphone a little closer sure. to you there? Yep. If you can. All right. Um, and... Do you still have that business? I do. Um, how did you get into the into the prop supply business? I got contacted um, in about 2009. Uh, had previously been consulting for a firearms business, indoor shooting range, in retail uh, segment, as well as some law enforcement training. So there was a crossover. And from that, I met... Uh, uh, an individual that was working in the film industry and at some point he said he needed some help and it was just going to be a two-month thing turned into 15 years okay uh, and, and that individual uh, what kind of work did that individual do he did a similar thing where he provided he set up weapons sent them out onto shows and also worked as an armor on set okay um, So, how long have you owned PDQ Props? It's been about 12 years, maybe 13. Okay. And at some point, sir, uh, did you meet a gentleman by the name of Thel Reed? I did, very briefly. Oh, I was aware of Thel Reed um, because we were on opposite ends. He was working set on, um, on Django Unchained. And I was behind the scenes working with the prop master, preparing the weapons that were going to be used by cast. Um, so I was aware of him then. Uh, and then very briefly, one day, a prop master brought him into uh, the LA Prop House Arsenal, where I did actually meet him. It wasn't again until about 2018, where we became friends. Okay. Um, so when the two of you became friends, um, what was what did Thel do for a living, and how did it relate to what you did? Well, primarily, he's more than anything. He's a, he's a gun coach, um, and he does work set as an armor as well. But something that he's unrivaled in is is as being a gun coach. Um, as an armor, he does a fantastic job, or he did uh, back in the day. So um, he would he would work set. Uh, and on the back end, I would prepare the weapons for the most part. I work set as, as little as possible. Okay, when you say work set, what do you mean? Actually, uh, ending up on a call sheet, being hired by a film production. It could be episodics. It could be any, any TV show that you might see. Uh, you know, Walking Dead, for, in, uh, Walking Dead, for instance. Uh, and then, or it could just be a feature film. Uh, like Django and Chain, and so when you when you are hired by production, uh, you end up being an employee or an independent consultant for that production. Okay, uh, so working on set was not your thing. Definitely not my focus. Okay, um, and what at some point in time did you and Mr. Reed? Um, work on a film together where Mr. Reed was uh, an armorer or a coach and you were the vendor, the, the supplier. That was, uh, it was 1883. Uh, it wasn't a feature film. It was more of a, you know, one run episodic. Um, and I had been working with Taylor Sheridan's prop master. Um, and who's Taylor Sheridan? Taylor Sheridan is a writer, director of of the Paramount production, and he's kind of created his own segment of Americana that's very popular. 
Uh, are you talking about uh, Yellowstone and 1883? Yellowstone 1883, uh, Yellowstone 1923, uh, Mayor of Kingstown, uh, Sicario. He wrote Sicario, both, I believe, uh, Wind River, amazing movie. Okay. That was actually the first time that uh, I, I had been a provider consultant for Taylor Sheridan was on Wind River. Okay. Uh, let's jump back to 1883. Uh, describe for the jury, please, how you and Mr. Reed sort of uh, worked together on that series. Well, I had to push hard to get him onto the crew and hired. Um, and so we talked about it, and I was, I'm fairly tight with a prop master. You know, again, we've been working together since Wind River. Um, and I convinced him to hire Thale um, and to keep him on longer than most gun coaches or older persons would be allowed on set. You know, frankly, the Texas heat was just too much for him. Um, so, and, and just so that everyone knows, approximately how old is Mr. Reed now? Exactly, I don't know, but he's going to be pushing 80. Okay. Um, so, in what capacity was Mr. Reed um, hired on the set of 1883, was he a coach or an armorer? Primarily, he was a, he was the gun coach, and he and he had difficulty with the Texas heat. So you know, I was constantly making sure that he was in an air conditioned environment, and that's not, just not something that a, a a set on Texas allows for. Sure. Um, so describe for the jury the kind of gun coaching that was being done on 1883? Well, it, it, it involved initially, it was pretty casual and we were using replicas and it in, in happened to be Taylor Sheridan's private um, uh, arena. When you it, say replicas, are you talking about real guns or fake guns? These are fake, these are fake guns, okay. replicas, yeah. And, and so that's where it started. It's kind of a meet and greet and just get some of the basics down. And Thale, you know, he's been doing it for so many decades, 60 plus years as a gun coach and armor. Uh, he knows uh, small bite-sized pieces to the, to the actors is at best. Okay. So. Um, was there uh, coaching sessions that included real firearms? There were, then at, at some point uh, it was decided uh, uh, and I'm not sure who made that decision, that they actually wanted to um, set up in, in, uh, a private range on a portion of Taylor Sheridan's private ranch uh, with an appropriate backstop and it controls. And that is where the, um, the cast, it was a bit of a team building as well, learned about the the how the function, the functioning of the firearms, you know, and we were mixed between blanks and live, um, we had live ammunition in one area and then take people off to the side and shoot blanks. And essentially the safe distance on most blanks is about 20 feet. So we would take them away from the firing line and test and train them there. And primarily they had gotten it by that point. They had really understood for their characters what they needed to be and do on set. So you mentioned that during uh, these coaching sessions, uh, some of the cast was shooting with live ammunition. Is that correct? That's correct. And do you recall what kind of caliber weapons the cast uh, was using to shoot that live ammunition from? It was a mix we had available from memory, uh, 12 gauge birdshot, just the basics of, of that. I don't think we even, we even touched that ammo. Um, the prop master had some guns that were chambered in 357, I believe, some lever actions, uh, and also in 45 Colt or 45 Long Colt. Both are okay. Both All right. terms. Um, can you explain to the jury? Well, let me ask you this. Do you know where the live ammunition came from that was used in those coaching sessions? I do. Well, where did it come from? The 45 Long Colt came from Thale. Um, he had a number of reloads uh, that I asked him to bring because at that time it was very difficult to source live ammunition. Uh, it was it was difficult. 
So he had uh, what turned out to be 325 reloads of 45 long Colt. And when you say reload, what are you talking about? Well, it's it, it's once used case. So every case of ammunition starts out as new. And at that point... Oh, wait, what do you mean when you say case? The actual brass case. So if we talk about a round of ammunition, there are four components to that. There's the yellowish colored brass case, the primer that is pressed into the base of the case. Then we have gunpowder, some type of, it could be black powder, synthetic black powder, modern uh, smokeless powder, and then you need a projectile. And so those four, co those four components make up a single round of ammunition. Okay, uh, so the, um, the live ammunition that was used for the coaching session was provided by Mr. Reed? Correct. And if you know, I don't know if you do, do you know where he got it? Yes, he said he got it from Joe Swanson. Okay, and who's Joe Swanson? Joe Swanson is probably the primary supplier of blanks and dummy rounds to worldwide. Uh, if, if you happen to see something go bang in a puff of smoke in a, in a movie or, or an episodic a television show, worldwide, chances are that Joe Swanson made it. Okay. <clears throat> now... Was all of the 45 Long Colt live ammunition that was used for the training camp on 1883, was it all used up? No. Uh, so can you tell us approximately how much was left over? Uh, it was, if memory serves me correct, uh, it was about 125 rounds, roughly. And what happened to that ammunition after you finished training the actors on 1883? Well, that's a little bit hazy. At one point, I do recall that um, it, certain things were offloaded um, from my sprinter van because they just weren't needed. Um, and that was, that was one of those things. But at some point, it got moved back to Albuquerque, and I've never been able to pinpoint the date. Um, the live ammunition was moved back to Albuquerque? Correct. And specifically, where in Albuquerque was it being housed? It was in a gray bin marked live ammunition, and it was actually in the bathroom. Of where? Of uh, PDQ's location in Albuquerque. Of your business? Correct. Okay. Um, and can you explain to uh, the jury how you... Um, how you would keep, how did you know it was live and how were you able to keep it separate from dummies and blanks? Well, it's, it's, it's obviously, it's a concern. Anytime you've got these things in, let's just say one structure. Um, and in this instance, always better to keep live ammunition near blanks rather than dummy rounds because Dummy rounds and live ammunition can look exactly the same. So if, if we were to look, if I were to set aside a single blank and a, piece of, and, a, and a round, single round of live ammunition, it would be obvious which is which, just from looking at it, okay? The same cannot be said for live ammunition. So these are, these are things that should never be next to each other. Um, did you keep all of the 45 Long Colt live ammunition in the gray bin? It was in the gray bin, and it was marked on two sides live ammunition. Um, did you have 45 Long Colt live ammunition stored anywhere other than the gray bin at PDQ in Albuquerque? No. And. Do you recall um, a search warrant being executed at PDQ? I do. And when the search warrant was executed, were you present? I was. Um, did you aid the police? Absolutely. 
Um, and did you provide law enforcement all of the 45 Colt live ammunition that you had at PDQ? Yes, and it wasn't it wasn't spelled out in the warrant that way. Um, it if my memory serves me correct, the warrant specified that any any live yeah. Well, and it's okay. I'll, okay. I'll I'll make we'll move on from that. I understand your concerns. Um, so let's not talk about the warrant, okay? Um, was there another show that you and Mr. Reed uh, both supplied firearms and ammunition to after 1883? No. So let, me, let, let me did did you supply firearms or and when I say ammunition I apologize I mean blanks and dummies um, to the set of a movie called The Old Way. Yes, but th that was filming concurrently with 1883. Okay, they were happening at the same time. Yes. All right. Um, so the. What did you wait, provide? Excuse me. Wait. Actually, sorry. Um, now that I think about it, actually, Hannah was wrapping the old way, and we were still in pre-production at that point. That we I don't think we had gone to camera yet. On 1883. Yeah, I, I remember being in Texas at the time when Hannah was wrapping out the old way, which is essentially concluding filming. They, you know, no more camera work at all. Right? She's packing up her guns. She's packing up her you know, her bags okay. to, to leave Livingston, Montana. And we were still prepping to go to camera, but working for production on 1883. Okay. Uh, so you indicated that Hannah was involved in uh, the movie The Old Way. Can you explain to the jury in what capacity was she working on that film? Well, it was her first solo lead um, as head armor um, and... Thale got in touch with me and said no, that. Hang on, I don't want any hearsay. Okay. Um, so, so she she was the lead armor, and that was the first movie she was lead armor on. Correct. Okay. Um, explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you supplied to the set of the old way. It, roughly uh, half the guns, most of them the long arms, which are lever actions and shotguns and single shot uh, rifles as well. And then there was a mix of about 50-50%, 50% fail, 50% PDQ supplied the blanks. Um, I supplied 14 rounds of 38-40 dummy rounds. And Thale and Hannah supplied the balance of the dummy rounds. Okay, so you supplied the only dummies that you supplied to the old way were caliber 3840. Correct. Did you supply any 45 long colt dummy rounds to the set of the old way? No, I didn't have any. And you only supplied 14? 38, 40 dummies? It's all I had, yeah. Okay. Um, and it's your understanding that Mr. Reed and Ms. Gutierrez supplied the remaining dummy rounds to that show? Yes. Um, The dummy rounds that Ms. Gutierrez supplied to the set of the old way, uh, if you know, do you know where she got them? She got them from Thale. All right. Um, do you do you source uh, a lot of your ammunition from Mr. Swanson? A hundred percent. Actually, no. Excuse me, ninety percent. Um, and do you source from Mr. Swanson? And again, not ammunition. 
I understood. Dummy rounds and blanks. Okay. Um, do do you source both dummy rounds and blanks from Mr. Swanson? Dummy rounds, a hundred percent from Joe Swanson. Okay. Um, I think we should look at some pictures if we can get set up. Mr. Bowles, will you have a look at something with sure. me? But I don't want it. I don't want it to be displayed yet. So here's just so that you know. What So he and I Thank you. Um, Mr. Kenny, do you see the photograph on your screen? I do. Thank you. Um, have you ever had a box of dummies from Mr. Swanson with that label? No, never. And why would you not have a box with this label if you're sourcing your dummy rounds from Mr. Swanson? Well, 1883 was the first period show that um, that I needed uh, 45 long cold dummy rounds for. Uh, prior to that, even though we had done flash, a flashback scene with Tim McGraw and Yellowstone, th there was no call for dummy rounds or the prop master sourced them elsewhere. Um, so I, I just never needed them. And when I did, it was I needed them by the thousands, not by boxes of 50. And so what happened is uh, Joe Swanson, he asked me, do you want me to package them up? I said, no, there's no point, You're right? It's more work for everybody. So he uh, s uh, sent them to me in bulk. Okay, and so you never had anything like this in your possession? Never. And let's talk about the um, dummy rounds that you provided to the set of rust. Did you provide 45 long colt dummy rounds to the set of rust? I did, I supplied a single box of, uh, of 50 on October 12th. And the, where did those dummy rounds come from? They had just come off of the day prior um, from the prop truck in Texas. Uh, from 1883. So when you took the dummy rounds that you supplied to the set of rust from the prop truck on 1883, walk us through what you did with them. It, yeah, so the, uh, the Sarah and Hannah um, had issues with a couple of guns and uh, so potentially they needed re uh, replacements. There was an issue with the reassembly after cleaning. So I pulled uh, some of PDQ's inventory from the 1883 prop truck uh, to make sure that I had something to replace. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a 45 long Colt 
chambered gun that matched what they had on uh, on rust. But I did find one in chambered in 4440. Uh, so I took that gun, a box of 4440 dummy rounds, and also spotted some antiqued uh, 45 long Colt dummy rounds in bulk and put them literally into, and into a double bag of uh, some type of grocery store bag. Uh, and they went, those three items went into my Sprinter van and I drove uh, straight from that set to uh, my PDQ's location in Albuquerque. And when you got to the PDQ location in Albuquerque, um, what did you do with the 45 long Colt dummy rounds that you brought from 1883? They, uh, it's kind of an odd thing to say, but it, because there were probably a considerable amount of money in firearms in the van at the time that were headed back to California, uh, I slept in the van with, with the guns. Uh, behind closed gates, but that's just what you have to do. So it wasn't until the morning of the 12th that they were brought into into the you know my place uh, PDQ's uh, location in Albuquerque. Okay, and what did you do with them when when you brought them inside? Well, I got rid of the the grocery bags straight away, and I built a small brown cardboard box, and they got poured into there. Uh, Sarah Zaku was running late. Um, and when she showed up, I was able to reassemble and test the gun. And let uh, me stop you real quick, ju just so that we're connecting all the dots. What, why was Sarah Zachary coming to PDQ on, on October 12th? Well, she needed to, to find out whether or not I could quickly reassemble the gun without issue and make sure that it was ready to uh, be used on camera for rust. And were you able to do that? I was. Okay. Uh, but she ended up running probably three hours late, um, and I had nothing else to do. Essentially, I was just headed, waiting to meet with her and, and drive to California. So um, while I was sitting there doing nothing, I looked at these overly antiqued eight um, rounds that had been dipped in a chemical uh, that patinaed not only the lead bullets but also the cases very heavily too heavily and they didn't look right they didn't look right for camera so I just sat there and decided well I'll just see what it looks like after I polish them up with some quado steel wool and that's what I did what I realized though too is that some of the chemicals seem to have leaked into the case and some of the rattles seem muddy um, and what do you mean when you say some of the rattles seemed muddy well it's we Joe Swanson, for the most part, stopped using BBs inside the dummy rounds because the uh, the cam the uh, the sound guys could hear them on camera. So if the gun is being manipulated, he could actually hear the dummy rounds rattling around. And there's a number of instances where I can hear dummy rounds in TV and and in movies. Um, where I can spot it, and I'm like, oh, you can hear the dummy rounds rattling. It's kind of interesting. So he switched to using a single piece of number two lead shot, which is an adequate rattle, but it's a little bit muffled. And I, and I suspect what had happened is the chemical had caused some kind of gooey layer, to my best guess. And so I noticed that some of the, they just didn't sound safe to me. It, it just didn't sound like I wanted you know, Hannah and Sarah to have to be dealing with something that seems odd. And so I selected, um, before I sat there and polished each dummy round, I had to make sure, one, it rattled before I spent a minute polishing around. If we're talking about a box of 50 plus writing a label on both ends, I sat there with this box for an hour. So they got rattled before they got polished, polished, and then re-rattled to make sure they, you know, they would rattle without issue and then individually inserted into the box. Okay, hang on just a second.
Mr. Kenny, I'm going to show you uh, what has previously been entered into uh, evidence as Defendant's Exhibit L43. I'm not going to switch over to the ELMO for this because it requires too many steps and it'll take too long. Do you recognize that? I do. What is this a photo of? It's a photo of the uh, the brown cardboard box that I had just taped up to purposely hold those aged dummy rounds. And you can see in the picture what they look like before being polished with Quado steel wool. Okay. Um, I am going to show you uh, what has been marked as State's Exhibit 174. Uh, there's no objection to um, admitting this into evidence, and I'd like to publish. States 174 is admitted. You may publish. Mr. Kinney, what is this a photo of? That's the same box. Just it's missing the. I think I, I saw some spent uh, blank cases in the box as well as the quadro steel wall. Okay. Um, so when did you take this photograph? I don't recall. Um, it is is this a photograph of the dummy rounds that you provided to the set of rust? That's correct. So it would it would have to be the the picture was either taken on October twelfth or after. Okay. Because that that box and those those dummy rounds didn't exist until that morning of October twelfth. Okay. Um, and after you, I think you indicated that you. Rattled them, polished them, and rattled them again. Is that right? Correct. And did you, how did you provide them um, to the set of rust? Were they in a bag? Were they in a box? They were in a, in a white box um, with Gaffer, white gaffer tape, which is kind of a, a pattern tape, um, very strong. And I hand wrote in blue Sharpie ink on both ends of the box what the contents of it were. All right, I'm going to show you what has been previously entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 48. Do you recognize that? I do. What's that? That is the box of dummy rounds that I supplied to um, to Sarah Zachary uh, on October 12th. So the dummy rounds that we saw in the box, in the in the brown box in the previous photo, uh, you took those and you put them into this box. What what, is, what we see in the in the brown box with the aged dummy rounds is the remainder. Because again, I didn't. I didn't just take 50 rounds. I, I I took, I would estimate, up to nearly 100 in total. So we've got this is a box that contained 50 dummy rounds, a, aged and polished, um, and the remainder was left in that brown court cardboard box. When you're talking about the remainder. Are you talking about what's shown in Defendant's Exhibit L43? Yes. And the other photo of the brown box without the steel wool, is that, are those the ones that actually ended up in the box and went to rest? No, those are still the remainder. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you what has been uh, entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 48A. Do you recognize that? I do. What's that? It appears to be that same, uh, the, the foam insert uh, and dummy rounds, the, the polished antique dummy rounds that I gave to Sarah Zachary on October 12th. Although, yeah. one of them appears like it doesn't belong. You talking about this one? I believe it to be that round. Uh, it doesn't look like it's had any aging, and I think in, I've, I've seen it in other evidence photos where they're laid on their side and it stands out. So, let, and hang on just a second. Let's, let's do this. Let's, uh, let me show you. 
uh, what has been previously entered into evidence as States Exhibit 166. What's the round you're talking about? That's it. If we look at the top row and, and all the way to the right of the top row, just beneath that, it appears that, that round is uh, inconsistent. Circle. I don't have the touch. So that round that I've circled in red does not appear. Uh, like the others, and I have a tough time thinking that I would uh, provided that round. Okay, um, and after you gave the box to Ms. Zachary and it was taken to the set of rust, do you know what was done with it after that? No, I had, it, even if she left it in her car, I had no idea what she had done with it. Okay. Whether or not they used it or, or not. Okay. I'm going to show you... Um, what has been previously entered into evidence as States Exhibit 39. Do you recognize that? I've seen this photo before, yes. Um, do you recognize the dummy rounds that appear to be in the belt? Is it hard to tell from it's this photo? It's hard to tell, yeah. Okay, so let's... In the, uh, the shadows in the photos are, make it difficult as well. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and move to um, States Exhibit 40. This is previously entered into evidence. Um, does that photo help? It does. Uh, so I believe we've heard testimony that these are, from the crime scene uh, specialist, that these are the rounds that were taken out of the belt. Um, does that look, do those look like your rounds? They do. They're, they're definitely similar. Um, a higher resolution on an iPad would be ideal, but they look very similar. Can I guarantee that those are the PDQ rounds? No, it would be difficult to say. Um, uh, casually, yes. Court of law, eh, not okay. so much. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to show you what has been previously uh, entered into evidence as States Exhibit 49. Do you see that? I do. Um, and do you see that uh, this photograph has a has an extra round up here? I do. Um, are you familiar with what a Denix round is? I am. Um, what what's a Denix round? Well, it's it's a it's a costume round. Um, what's it, the difference between a costume round and a dummy round? Costume rounds uh, don't rattle. Um, the first off, the Denix round uh, that I've found, that I've tested, won't chamber in a gun either. The, the cast manufacturing seam is out of spec, so even though it says 45 Colt or 45 Long Colt on the end of it, uh, you actually can't get it to chamber. Um, Hang on just a second. When you said the cast manufacturing seam... Can you see that in the photo? I can, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and underline it. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, have you ever had Denix rounds in your um, inventory? No, because it's, 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 it's something that uh, if, it, if it doesn't rattle and it's coming from a weapon supplier, a vendor, it sets a dangerous precedent that we can say dummy some dummy rounds don't rattle. And there is definitely debate regarding this point. PDQ, though, and I have never sent out any dummy round that doesn't rattle, whether or not the primer has been struck by a firing pin. So even if we're talking about, well, we can assume that because the firing pin has hit the primer, it must be a dummy round and there's nothing in it. And that is definitely not the case. There are a number of instances where hard primers will not go off with just one hit of a firing pin. 
And so we and we don't know that that's a purpose built dummy round. Unless it rattles, it's not to be trusted. Okay. Um, and did did you provide a Denix round to the set of rest? No. And it's your testimony that the Denix rounds actually don't really fit in the revolver. Is that right? The ones that I've tested do not. Okay. Because of the seam. Because of the seam. And it appears overall that that they're oversized very slightly, but it's enough to prevent them from being inserted into a, uh, a revolver. Okay. Um, and do you know a gentleman by the name of Billy Ray? I don't know him personally. We've communicated. Actually, no, excuse me, let me back up. We did meet briefly. We met briefly. He owns a, uh, a similar uh, company providing weapons and props as well as dummy rounds and blanks to productions. I believe he's a set uh, designer. Uh, did you reach out to Billy Ray uh, with regard to supplying dummy rounds to the set of Rust? I did. Uh, again, PDQ, everything we had slated... Uh, uh, in inventory was to be used on 1883, so we didn't have uh, any 45 Colt dummy rounds. So I reached out to Billy Ray by text and asked him if he did have any in stock because uh, they needed more. And did he have any? He did not, but what he did have, which appears on camera, uh, and, and to anyone else, if you were to, to insert these, what he did have into a leather gun belt from three feet away, you wouldn't know what was in that uh, gun belt. And so what he had was spe very specifically, he got back to me and said, I have 98 4440 demi rounds and 423840 dummy rounds. And were those provided to the set of rest? Uh, he met up with Sarah Zachary, and, and that's how they ended up, I'm assuming, on set. And are you the person that connected them so that Ms. Zachary could obtain the dummy rounds? Yes. Um, so, to the best of your knowledge, did Billy Ray provide any 45 long colt dummy rounds to the set of rust? No, I mean, he was very specific. I mean, uh, casually you'd say, well, I've got three boxes that'll work. But he went into greater detail. Okay, and, and let me let me stop you there. And when you were talking about having a, a thirty-eight forty or a or, or a forty-four forty dummy round in a gun belt, uh, you said that you the the viewer wouldn't know what they were looking at. That's correct. And is that because they look very very similar to forty-five long colt? It, yes. So in terms of dummy rounds, we understand that you provided some and we've looked at those photos. You've testified that Billy Ray provided some and you've explained that to us. Was there anyone else who provided 45 long colt dummy rounds to the set of rust? Yes. Who's that? That was Hannah. And if you know where did Ms. Gutierrez say that she got the dummy rounds from that she took on to the set of rust? It was the same supply uh, that she had gotten from Thale uh, that she used on the old way. And how do you know that? Common, you know, it was just conversation and text message. She told you? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you what has been marked as State's Exhibit 175. It's my understanding that there is no objection to this, and I would uh, ask permission to publish. No objection. State's 175 is admitted. You may publish. Uh, sir, have you seen this before? I have. And. What is this? It's a conversation. Who's participating in the conversation? Uh, sorry, I've broken my glasses. Um, 
Yeah, it's a, conver it's a text conversation between myself and Hannah. Um, and what's the, what's the date of this conversation? Again, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses. Uh, October, f was it 5th? Do you, do you need some readers? I probably have no, five pairs. No, it's I, the new prescription. I broke my glasses, and the new prescription is it makes me feel nauseous. So let's see. If I take a picture. Of it. Does that help you? Oh yeah, October fifth. Okay. Uh, what What are you and Ms. Gutierrez talking about here? Well, we're we're talking about the. Um, let's see. Well, what specifically? Yeah, well, there's a few dates in there. Go ahead and just take a moment and review it, and then I'll ask you some questions about it. Well, I'm asking her about how she was looking on, you know, for leather. Uh, and what it, when you say leather, what do you mean? Uh, it would be primarily gun belts, but it could also mean bandoliers as well. I don't think, uh, I don't recall that Rust had call for bandoliers. Um, it was just primarily, you know, gun belts and holsters. Each gun belt holds roughly, can hold up to 18 rounds of... Uh, Okay. Um, so to, to kind of move through this in this text conversation, uh, does Ms. Gutierrez indicate to you um, that she can't find any of the dummies? Yeah, and she mentions, you know, some of them are still in the belt. In, in the belts. So hang on. Yep. Um, when she says she can't find any of the dummies, what is your response? Uh, <laughs> sorry about this. What happened to the dummy? Yeah, what happened to the dummy rounds from toe? The which is an abbreviation of the old way. Okay, and what's her response? Some of them are still in the belts. Yeah. Um, and then, what do you explain to her? Uh, something about dummy rounds don't get returned. What 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 are you telling her? Uh, and let me know if you need me to. Do you need me to make it bigger? I mean, I might as well just pull it up on my phone. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I was just explaining, you know, to her that um, she needs to, um, you know, let me know, or as a normal course of business moving forward, um, now that she's no longer underneath her dad's <laughs> wing, that if something gets lost or damaged on set, um, it needs the production needs to pay for it. You you, you said that's an L and D. L and D, what does L &D mean? Lost and lost or damaged. Okay. And in this instance, she's just saying, you know, essentially, yeah, they, you know, they do, they fall, you know, just commonly, the dummy rounds fall out of out of gun belts for stunts, or even maybe picked up for souvenirs by extras or actors. Who knows? Okay. And uh, Ms. Gutierrez responds, and she actually, I think, confirms what you just said. Isn't that right? Yes. She says you never mentioned this. I definitely lost some off of the belts during the action scenes. Right, right. She says maybe like 50 total. I'm not sure. And then she says, so I have to round those up tomorrow and count these? Yep. That was the conversation. Um, and then does she say to you, you both just send me out to do these things and don't teach me right. Shame on both of you. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and you respond, you're a naughty child. I'll let Papa handle this one. Right. Were, were you joking? Partially. <laughs> um, and what was her response? Uh, so what if I need more? You guys <laughs> freaking blow. Okay. Um, so based on uh, State's Exhibit 175, was it your impression uh, that Ms. Gutierrez was bringing dummy rounds that were already loaded into gun belts? Absolutely. Not only that, but we were counting on it. What do you mean you were counting on it? Because there were there, you know, everything else from PDQ was slated for 1883. Uh, in fact, it, some of it wasn't even manufactured yet. So there was just no inventory. And the only way that she was they were going to have you know dummy rounds on rust is by reaching out to other suppliers in the business and they needed them straight away and billy ray happens to be in albuquerque so that's a that's a straight away solution okay was it was it your understanding from that conversation with ms gutierrez 
that the dummy rounds that she was providing to the set of rust were left over from the old way. Yes. <clears throat> um, I'm going to take you to the. I'm going to take you to October 21st, 2021. Um, do you recall that day? Yes. And let me ask you, prior to October 21st of 2021, were you ever physically present on the set of rest? No. Um, when was the first date that you were physically present on the set of rest? It was uh, when the sheriff's department executed the warrant on the prop truck. And why did you need to be present for the sheriff's department to execute the warrant on the prop truck? It wasn't that I needed to be um, as much as I felt I, I, I wanted to be there to facilitate. And how did you intend to facilitate? Well, just to be available to answer questions that, that may have come up. Um, in addition to providing blank ammunition and some dummy rounds to the set of rust, did you also provide firearms? Yes. Approximately how many firearms did you provide, if you recall? Approximately 30. And do you know where the 30 firearms that you provided were being stored? They were being, yes, they were being stored um, on the prop truck, in the safe. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and, and let me ask you specifically, did you provide to the set of rust uh, the Pieta 45 that uh, became Mr. Baldwin's prop gun. I did. And where did you get that gun from? Those, ga uh, those guns came from Pieta's. Pieta is an Italian manufacturer, and they supplied. They they have a principal, and, and I think it's a single importer located in California. And I purchased them specifically for the Rust Show. Um, directly from their facility in California. And do you know when you purchased that gun, uh, was it new or was it used? Baldwin's gun was uh, was brand new, as, as were, uh, I believe, it's 11 of the 12 revolvers uh, that were rented to the Rust Production were all brand new. Um. So I'm going to take you back to October 21st. On October 21st, did you find out that there was some sort of an injury that had taken place on set? I did. Um, I missed a call from Sarah Zachary, and quickly thereafter, she sent me a, um, a single word by text, in all caps, emergency. And when you received that text, what did you do? I called her back within a few minutes. Okay. Um, and, and let me ask this. During that conversation, uh, did you tell Sarah Zachary to do anything with any of the um, dummy rounds or firearms or anything like that on set? No, absolutely not. Um, After your conversation with Ms. Zachary, um, did you call Mr. Reed? I did. I, I, I tried several times to get a hold of him and were by you, phone. Were you ultimately able to get a hold of him? I was. He returned, uh, and I, I recall texting him as well, um, and he did finally return my call. Okay, and I'm not going to ask you what he said during that call. Um, During the filming of Rust, uh, did you occasionally communicate with Ms. Gutierrez? Yes. And was there a time that you and Ms. Gutierrez um, had a disagreement? 
The primary disagreement occurred on October 16th. And what was, what, what was the subject matter of that disagreement without saying what anyone said? Subject matter um, related to an accidental discharge of a, of a blank on the set of rust. Okay. Um, after the disagreement that you had with Ms. Gutierrez on October 16th, did you, if you recall, did you speak to her again before this, between the 16th and the 21st? No. Um, and why weren't you uh, speaking to her? Was there was there anything that she did or said during the October sixteenth conversation that was upsetting to you? Well, it was clear that she was emotional. She sent um, she sent me a text message uh, back that had uh, a, a number of expletives associated with it. And uh, and so, you know, I just felt that she needed some space and maybe an apology was due, uh, and I was just going to give it some time. An apology was due to who? Well, I thought to me. Okay. Um, Understood. Um, sir... Did you provide any live ammunition to the set of rust? No. Did you ever give any live ammunition to Sarah Zachary? No. Have you seen photos of the live ammunition that was found on the set of rust? I have. Did you possess any ammunition that looked like that? No. At some point in time after the incident on the 21st, did you become aware that um, you were perhaps being blamed? I, yeah, I started to sense um, that there was efforts to redistribute blame or the, the cause of, of this accident. Uh, was there a was there a morning news show that you watched that? Yeah, I'm not judge. 